Hi. So it appears that the Senate will be able to confirm a uh, justice or Judge Barrett to the Supreme Court by a margin of probably either 51, uh, you know, or, or, some, or 52, which is all they need, even if they had 50, because the uh, tiebreaker is decided by the vice president. Uh, there is, at this point, a almost 100% chance that the Supreme Court will be uh, majority Republican, majority conservative, and even further, majority Catholic. It is already Catholic. It appears that we are moving farther and farther uh, to the right. And that's being driven by a, a political infrastructure that seems less than diverse. Now, it turns out that Sotomayor is also Catholic. Um, and so you see that within, well, you know, we're not dealing with a homogenous political hierarchy. You're dealing with, in many cases, a, uh, an assumption that within the Catholic Church, you have many people who are many individuals who favor social justice, who favor social welfare. And this has been reflected in the uh, Pope Francis and his shift towards the left. Now, I'd like to talk about why that may not be the most sincere shift. And we're seeing, in fact, that the political structure remains firmly conservative. Part of that is because the legal system uh, is was designed to, at least initially, do some very basic things. Um, you know, have a currency that's you know, universally recognized, have a military that can protect your borders, and so on and so forth. And of course, have a judicial system that can mediate contracts and or excessive or burdensome governmental overreach. And of course, the recording of real estate property and property interests. You know, this, this Constitution famously, famously includes a three-fifths clause where, you know, the founders of the country decided that a human being was worth about three-fifths of a property-owning person for purposes of allocation and voting power and so on and so forth. In order to... And that, I believe, was designed in order to create a system that placated the North and the South and tried to avoid or head off, you know, civil war and so on and so forth. If you look at the history of the United States as one where much of the concentration of ownership of real estate has, has flown from the proceeds of slave labor and the buying and selling and transatlantic slave trade, you can see that we're dealing with, a, with an issue where it would make sense to, that there would in fact be a split, an ideological split within the property ownership of this country. The real question I have is, which came first? Is it a situation where you know, we're in a position where, the, where once disfavored minorities, which would include the Catholic Church, which was banned in New York, under, under the assumption that it was a political movement, not really a religion, under one of those assumptions, is, was it the case that democracy was used in, in, on a local level in order to take over police departments and then extend influence that way? How was it that we are in a position where we have an incoming president, most likely, who is Catholic, a, somebody on the other side who was about to appoint a Catholic Supreme Court justice? Once again, not a diverse choice at all, despite the fact that she is a woman. Ideologically, it's clearly an appointment that favors, once again, the conservative, conservative wing of the Catholic Church. So, if you're a minority and you're looking at all this, 
perhaps you're reminded of Malcolm X. Malcolm X famously said that, you know, we can only, you know, first of all, give us the 40 acres and a meal. We can, and he, he believed that Martin Luther King's appeal to the conscience of the white man was futile. He said that the only way we're going to be able to become self-sufficient and in a position where we can grow is if we are, if we separate, which if you think about it, is starting to make more sense. If you do separate, then you're able to have your own judges, you're able to have your own police department, and you're able to be under a position where you're not subject to the whims of a racial majority or a religious majority that may have a different understanding of history than you do. And in the case of the Catholic Church, it is a severe chasm when you're dealing with an ideological understanding of history. Primarily because the Catholic Church has gained a lot of its property through accepting and actually promoting chattel slavery much longer than any other, relig any other religion. And so even if you go to Mexico today, uh, where they speak Spanish because they were colonized by Catholic Spain before the, the French took over, you'll see that even today in the government capital, the majority of people sitting in power have light skin, have white skin. And you'll see the same thing in property ownership. And you start to realize that this comes from a European historical perspective where the Catholics had the opportunity to seize power. They moved from Rome into what was called the New, the New Holy Roman Empire in the Saxony region in Germany. And then, of course, you had, you know, in 1848, you had problems. You had World War I, World War II. Even today, you have issues because the most conservative anti-immigrant party within Germany is from the region that has a significant, if not the most, number of Catholics in all of Germany. As well as, and interestingly, the most number of the region or the province also has a, a majority of American troops or American military bases. So you see this idea that religion is global and because it is global, it is not restricted financially or ideologically in any one place. What is, you know, interesting is how that influence seeks to extend itself and whether it does so on a sustainable basis. With respect to the Catholic Church, the European history is remarkably intolerant. We know that, you know, most of us should know that Hitler's mother was Catholic, Hitler was taken to a Catholic Church from a young age, but it's also a situation where it's not only just the fact that the Catholic Church seems to be inimical towards the Jewish religion. When the Protestants took over, the Martin Luther was also opposed to the Jewish religion. He was very virulently anti-Semitic. And you see today within the United States, a much more acceptance, a much higher acceptance, much higher acceptance of the Jewish religion, but only after a, essentially a Catholic leader supported the wiping out of millions of Jews. So what we really have within this situation is a tolerance, actually intolerance, followed by tolerance, but only when the minority loses its ability to pose a threat to the establishment. In other words, at one point in time, you can see that the Germans may have been an open society. They, at that point, received a lot of very hardworking immigrants who were able to do very well for themselves. And as a result, uh, thrive in the private sector. This happens all over, right? If you know anything, you know, we can look at the Chinese uh, worldwide, the Lebanese worldwide, 
and so on and so forth. And you can also see how that situation could lead to resentment by the majority, assuming that they're able to, they're not able, not able to share in the wealth or the job growth. And you can see that the tolerance may not be sincere simply because despite the fact that the United States is in fact a fairly tolerant nation with respect to the Jewish religion, you can see that it's happened this way only after that particular religion is no longer able to create a democratic majority. In other words, has been democratically made futile and toothless within this country. And so you can also see that the country is in fact against Muslims. It is an openly so, not just Trump versus Hawaii, that Supreme Court decision, uh, it was just very much openly so in the media and so on and so forth. Also against African-Americans, you can see this is a consistent theme going you know, from George Floyd, going all the way back to Rodney King and so on and so forth without much accountability. So we can see that perhaps one reason for this antipathy towards the minorities versus quote tolerance towards minorities is whether or not they pose a threat to your ability to maintain power under a democratic system. And you can see that Muslims worldwide could be a significant threat within democratic systems if they decided to vote consistently together. Within the United States, it's the same scenario. You have a situation where African Americans, if they were able to follow the advice of Malcolm X, would be able to do quite well overall if they decided to vote consistently on and under a specific platform. And it bothers me when I'm saying this because what it really means is that for all of our vaunted human progress, there's really been no progress at all with respect to tolerance. Minorities have been elevated, in fact, in exactly the way that Malcolm X complained about which is in a superficial, pandering way in order to cover up deep-seated inequalities, also based on race, not just religion. And this is also one of the reasons you start to realize why the United States is, although certainly not the, not the only reason, why the United States is so comfortable, or the establishment within the, within the US is so comfortable elevating people who are, who are gay or lesbian into positions of power. Once again, you have a population within the US that cannot, because of its small numbers, perhaps one to 5% of the population, maybe a little bit more, but regardless, not enough to affect the establishment's hold on power. And this is really remarkable because even under Hitler in Germany, the Catholics were, were not a majority. The Protestants were obviously after Martin Luther took over and, and before him Jan Hus and so on and so forth. And so you see a sort of remarkable ability to, within the Catholic religion, to bend politics to its will and to its interests worldwide. Even today in Italy, the Catholic Church, I believe, owns a significant portion of the stock market believe at least 20%, probably more. That's just, it's just what we know about. It enjoys tax exemptions on almost all of its businesses, which are classified as nonprofits, whether hospitals or churches. And of course, this all goes back to the fact that the tax code favors real estate investments, which then leads to a very interesting scenario where a real estate tycoon becomes the president of the United States. None of this is foretold. But when you look at the tax code and you look at the fact that there is a significant concentration of property ownership in this country, in America, you can see that if you put those two things together, concentration of ownership, as well as the tax code's favorable treatment of not just nonprofits, I'm gonna cross the street over here, but other types of businesses, 
you can see that overall, many of the so-called private sector activities that we're used to could be called Trojan horses in terms of expanding real estate ownership, which tends to require expansion because it's so, it's based on debt. You know, there's this famous back and forth going on here in the US about whether or not, about how many, how much money Donald Trump has and how much money he pays in taxes. Well, if you really understand the real estate business, what you're trying to do is you're trying to, again, buy property that's undervalued, build something on it, and then, you know, get cash flow from it under a structure that favors these sorts of investments. And so you it, it heavily promotes concentration of ownership because if you know how to build one real estate complex, it's not that hard to build another one. You've already done it before and you can you're in a position where you can make incremental improvements over time and create a leadership position. And this is something where, that, where, that allows you to also use government funding because not only your tax credits and tax in incentives, but because voters tend to like the idea of, you know, taking a piece of land that's unused and putting something there that could be useful. So in many countries, by the way, the cement industry is used to hide assets and to, and to launder money. And the, which means that the construction companies are, are also quite corrupt in some cases because they derive a lot of their revenue from government contracts. And that makes a little bit more sense once you realize the government doesn't build anything itself. It submits a, a request for proposal. Uh, it calls for bids and then chooses bids. And you can also see that, you know, typically the lowest bid. You can also see how that structure favors existing owners and existing ownership. Because once again, as you're making incremental improvements, you're also able to figure out where you can cut costs and improve your margins. So when, when you look at the society, the society that we're in, it's quite odd to be here because it, the, tolerance, the level of tolerance is something that's sort of thrown at you everywhere you go. You'll see a rainbow flag on every block. You'll see, you know, a lot of marketing campaigns that emphasize tolerance, including from private corporations. Uh, Nike, for example, sponsored an athlete that the NFL, the football, American Football League, essentially blacklisted. That's a good thing. But you sort of wonder why we're in a society that allowed the blacklisting of a, of a, you know, athlete in the first place based on his or her legitimate political views. In this case, a protest against police misconduct towards the African-American community, which we know is an issue because we've seen the Rodney King video, we've seen the George Floyd video, and we're starting to understand perhaps that we don't necessarily live in a tolerant country but in a country that seeks to market tolerance in order to maintain the existing power structure. And you can see that this has gotten quite expensive. The cost of having something that is dishonest probably multiply in order to maintain the image. And we are now at a point in time where the United States has about a $26 trillion deficit, or excuse me, debt. It has an annual deficit of about a trillion dollars. <sighs> you can see, overall, if you compare this sort of scenario with a country like Singapore, which is much smaller and has had to balance China and the United States, two superpowers, you can compare the Singaporean model with the, United, with the American model. And Singapore is a country, despite its small size, that has a, an immigrant population or an expat population of 20% of a, which is quite high, much higher than the United States. You can see that Singapore does not have, you know, a net debt problem. In fact, it has a trillion dollar 
sovereign wealth fund in part due to investments by the United States. Because it's got, it's got a port that is vital to shipping in the South China Sea. And that port has been one of the most strategic ports throughout human history. And in fact, it was the taking of that port by the Portuguese, that area uh, over in Malacca, by the Portuguese that signaled the decline of Islamic civilization at that time and then ushered in the way for Catholic worldwide influence. And so when you put all these things together, a lot of the tolerance, quite frankly, seems contrived. You look at a, a place like Cupertino, which is quite uh, diverse, but then you start to realize that the, the city is majority Taiwanese, which means that it's a country that opposes China or historically has opposed China. It was, uh, Taiwan exists because in the Chinese revolution, a lot of the elites in China were kicked out of China. A lot of the real estate, people that owned property, uh, landlords and so on were kicked out, fled the country, took a lot of art, art with them to the point where Taiwan now has one of the, the best museums in the world uh, with respect to Asian history and art, if not the best. And then once they fled around the 1950s, they were protected by Eisenhower, Eisenhower's Navy and then we're able to give the Americans another port, another backup to Singapore, which was at the time controlled by the British, an American ally, and allow for the projection of American power. Of course, you also had Hong Kong at the time. So this tolerance that you see may not necessarily be what it appears on the surface. It may be something that's not only a marketing gimmick for something that's geared towards placating allies overseas in order to maintain shipping routes, which these days, because of the fact that the internet is sometimes, or in some cases, uh, built with respect to uh, maintaining underwater cables, you can also see that now it's not only an issue regarding shipping of tangible, tangible items, but much more. And you can see that none of this resolves the issue of concentration of ownership. None of it really is, resolves the issue of anything. And the question is, what are we going to do about all of this? And I don't know the answer. I'm just trying to create a scenario where people understand the issues so that we can move forward with a society that is actually tolerant that actually is open to immigrants, not because it needs them to maintain property values and other values that are based on more, more that are based more on debt than intrinsic value or the ability to gain revenue in the future. But really, it's the idea that something a city would be more valuable. The houses in one city would be more valuable than ones in another city because that city is a better job developing its residents' potential. Good luck trying to help, trying to figure out the answers. That's something I'm, I try to do every day.